Hey y'all, welcome to episode 40. I am Jenny O'Connor and I help multi-passionate creatives slay imposter syndrome so they can grow their influence and self-promote with grace. Let me ask you a question. Are you working a job that brings you no satisfaction while you look over your shoulder at all the things you wish you could be doing that truly light you up? Do you dream of somehow combining all of your loves into a venture that makes you actual money? I've created the multi-passionate master plan that will help you do just that. And I am launching the maiden voyage of this six week group coaching program in the first quarter of next year. If you are committed to making 2022 the year you stop working a job you hate and finally find the career love of your life, head on over to jennyoconnor.com forward slash master plan to jump on the wait list. This step is important, you guys, because folks on the wait list will get exclusive access to the course and six weeks of live coaching for more than 40% off. So if you miss out on being notified when I open the doors, you will miss out on getting all of the value that I so lovingly packed into the multi-passionate master plan for a literal steal. So go jump on the wait list today. I am so looking forward to chatting with today's guest because I think she's going to help me unravel some assumptions I have about everything enthusiasts and creative folks in general. And isn't that funny? I've done an episode on questioning your assumptions. So do as I say, not as I do. (laughs) Wendy Hunt is an artist, illustrator, free range thinker, musician, photographer, and writer. She has been an entrepreneur for over 20 years and has two Atlas projects to her credit, the Salton Sea Atlas and the Environmental Atlas of Abu Dhabi, for which she designed, illustrated, art directed, and project managed. How cool is that, you guys? She currently works as a brand and graphic designer, illustrator, and retail proprietress. I am all about her approach to personal branding, so let's dive in and learn more about why she does what she does. Hey, Wendy, how you doing today? Hey, Jenny, I'm doing well. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. I am doing fantastic. I'm so happy to see you, and I want really quickly to tell the listeners how we got connected. So um, another listener of the show, Kaoki DuPont, who is also an artist himself, a super talented woodworker, and someone I went to high school with, he reached out to me and said, you have got to talk to this woman. So I did what I always do, and I cyber stalked you. (laughs) And immediately knew that I did, that I did need to talk to you. And um, there's a lot of reasons why, and we'll, we'll get into them, but I really appreciate you being here with me today. So let me ask you what I usually start most of my interviews out by asking, have you always embraced your multi-passionate nature or did you struggle with it? Like, did you struggle to find one thing and stick to it? I struggled because wisdom, I I attended college with a, for a degree in illustration and the wisdom there is that you focus in as, you know, as I got a little older and you start learning about business, it's niching and anybody, basically the wisdom, and this always flummoxed me, the wisdom is you have to make sure your editors and your art directors understand the style you're going to bring to the table. If you're an illustrator, they need to feel at peace knowing that if they assign you a piece, they know the kind of result they'll get back. Mm. And that's not the way I ever operated. I had a number of things that I did, a number of different mediums I worked in. And so the struggle was feeling guilty that I couldn't seem to rein it in. And I just thought, well, I'm just kind of like one of those crazy people that doesn't have any sort of focus. So there's a lot of self-judgment. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The, the crazy, the like, I'm doing it wrong is something I can completely relate to. And how interesting that even in an artistic pursuit, you were still admonished to just pick a lane and stay in it. Like I would think at like, if you went to school for art, that would be a place where they would celebrate you wanting to do all of the things. So I find it really interesting that that was not your experience. No, because they were trying to prepare you for a career and any career has to have a business aspect to it. And it has to, they're going to be talking about higher, higher ability or, Mm -hmm. you know, your ability to be hired and to, or to get a career path going And that means that you do have to, like, you don't have to, but the wisdom is you're going to find more success. So that's what they taught. 
Yeah. And so, yeah, it makes total sense. It wasn't a, it wasn't a school that taught creativity. It was a school that taught how to pursue your creative specialty in a way that would earn income. You yeah. know, and it's a pity, honestly, that they weren't tending more to the spirit of, of the artists who were showing up. There are artists, there are creatives who are focused and they understand what they want to do right off the bat. But there are the few of us who, <laughs> who are a little more crazy and I should, that's again, that's a self-judgment, but there are those of us who, who find the passion everywhere. And so for me, it's like, I once told somebody, I was like, I'm really fascinated. I want to understand how a door jam works. I was sitting there every time I'd open a door, I'd be looking at the way the pieces of wood overlap because I was like, all right, what would you do first? That was just a puzzle my brain wanted to figure out. And they said, well, why do you want to know what I'd do it? I said, I don't know. I don't want to frame doors, but I want to understand how it's put together. Yeah. And I want to understand so that when I'm looking at it, I can understand. I, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I want to know how to make tortillas, you know, <laughs> how much water, how much flour. I want to know how to roll them thin because it's pretty tough though. I did try. It, I um, can't, I can't make tortillas very well. I'll be honest. I have the little tortilla press, but they come out too thick. I don't know. <laughs> but no, I can I totally kind of... relate to that. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is a trait that, that love of learning is a trait I'm finding as I interview you fascinating people for this show, that that is something that we all share. So love of learning how door jams work is just as applicable <laughs> to anything else. And I have this running thing that I say that I think that we would be the most useful people in a zombie apocalypse, because yeah. if you think about like having to start from like ground zero and rebuild, we would have all these weird skills that like no one else would have because they've never sat and contemplated how a door jam works. You know, I know we're fascinating to talk to. Yeah. And then you're right in a pinch, we'd probably be able to come up with a solution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really think that it's this, there's this movement towards celebrating our superpowers rather than dwelling on how we haven't fit in and how, you know, our brains feel sometimes like they're broken. So that is one of those things that I like celebrating is the sort of multitude or the breadth of skills and knowledge. Um, I, I think it's really important to, to be aware so, of. <laughs> I know you're the interviewer, but I was just going to say one of my big aha moments this last year was when my sister got diagnosed with ADD and she mm -hmm. just got diagnosed by the skin of her teeth. And a diagnosis isn't helpful other than the fact that it helps you understand where your solutions lie. I don't like, so when she got diagnosed, we, she went dove deep into what does that actually mean? And that you're talking about executive dysfunction and executive dysfunction doesn't mean fidgeting in a classroom and unable to sit still. It means that you're having problems with planning, time management, you're having problems across this, like even like reining in a brain that wants to keep going, you know, could affect your, your ability to sleep even. And once I realized for the longest time, she was like, I think you are too. And I was like, come on, man, I'm tired of listening to you talk about ADD because she got really fixated on it. But the truth is it's highly heritable. That means my kids all experience some level of executive dysfunction as do I, even though at age 52, I am now just recognizing where, where I was having problems, like missed deadlines, constantly missed deadlines when I was younger. And that avoidance of uh, doing something until the last minute, you can say that's part of the creative brain, but it is also <laughs> the inability to plan ahead and understand how to set stages for the development of a large project. So yeah. not being able to put together a large project is a symptom. So I found all of my solutions in the realm of when you look at people who are dealing with ADD, they have different ways, like uh, keeping things in front of, if you ever wondered why you keep piles of, of crap laying around your office, because I can't put it away or I won't remember it. Yeah. Now I never knew that's why I did it, but that is a, a really common symptom of someone with ADD is having to keep things in their line of sight. So like, for instance, this is my whiteboard 
because I, once I recognized that I had, um, I had to keep everything in my line of sight, then this is a huge tool for me for scheduling, for remembering that I have like minutia and, and things that I need to keep track of. And so my organization's changed since I realized that's what I was dealing with. Interesting. Anyway, I, there we go. I just kind of threw that in there because no. I feel like you're multi-passionate people <laughs> often we'll have this going on. Yeah. I am not, I, I don't, I've never received that diagnosis, but I regularly refer to myself as squirrel brained, meaning the squirrel distraction. I'm over here and out squirrel. <laughs> so yes. I do feel like I can relate to that struggle. And I actually like where you took this because my next question for you was going to be like, how are the members of your family? Are they also multi-passionate? Clearly, I mean, is your sister also multi-passionate in addition to being? She is in a different way. She's not, um, she doesn't do the creative stuff I do, but she's one of those brains that just like, she collects information everywhere. Hmm. And so when you're talking with her, she knows something about anything you'd be talking about and some of it in depth. Wow. She retains uh, information like crazy and she absorbs it like crazy. She reads avidly. Yeah, I, I am sort of operating under an assumption here that, that this is a highly genetic thing. And I do, I mean, I, I'm, my next question is about your parents, whether or not they were, because my mom absolutely was my dad a little bit less. So, and sometimes I talk to people who have one parent who, who was super multi-passionate and one who was absolutely a specialist, but I'm always curious. How's what's your story? Okay. So this is really interesting because again, diving into the ADD thing, if you go online right now, uh, women with ADD is a trend. I was going to say a fad, but it's a trend because we're not diagnosed which means that you have people who have been living with it forever and they don't know it. All they have is a lot of self-judgment. That's my mom. So okay. she's got a lot of passions and she doesn't let herself pursue them because she's got a lot of self-judgment about herself. So like, so for an older person undiagnosed, she'll have a lot of neuroses, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, a lifetime of depression she's been treated for and anxiety she's been treated for. And when you don't know the cause of it, you're going to exacerbate any trauma you've had in the past. That means that you, you escalate it, you give a lot of weight, and that's what she's done. Her childhood had traumatic moments in it, but from her perspective, it's everything and everything's wrong. My dad was multi-passionate more in the way that I am. And he, he said, I'm a jack of all trades, a master of none. And it wasn't said in a way like, from a positive perspective, he was a little sad that he kind of would jump from topic to topic, from passion to passion. And it's not that he didn't achieve things, but he, again, didn't understand why he was not focusing on one thing. And then here's the, that's the other part of this that I was going to say is they find that people with, with, these kind of executive dysfunctions tend to prefer to hang out with other people with the executive dysfunctions. So you'll find that they'll get married and then they'll have kids with the, the same types of problems. And you can only imagine how, if you've got a lot of self-judgment, you might raise your children with a lot of like, why are you doing it that way? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, was this something that was like supported inside of your family or did they try to sort of squash that tendency out of you? No squashing. There okay. was a lot of support, but there was, um, you learn not just from, uh, reinforced stuff, but from, um, example. And so you, I grew up with a lot of example of playing it small, being careful. That was my mom on my dad's side, having crazy ideas and pursuing things. So it ends up being a little struggle. That's the invisible struggle. The things you inherit from your parents from observation and you don't even recognize that you learned those lessons. Yeah. And that, and that message, wherever it comes from that success looks like doing just the one thing, you know, that clearly is a message your dad got, even though he was, he finished stuff and he just had all of these different things. Do you know that that quote, Jack of all trades, master of none has another sentence sometimes better than a master of one. 
and they, and they cut like that and, and they cut that out and it becomes derogatory, I, like something we should be like, we're not masters at anything. So we kind of suck at life. And if that's not, they're actually saying this is sometimes better than specializing. And I think it's a toss up. I think there are moments where a specialist is exactly what we need to solve a thing. And I think that there are times when a multi-passionate person is what we need, but I, isn't it interesting that that part just gets left out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Cause I've never heard it yeah. here. So I'm going to take a little photo of you. This is for uh, some, my, my VA who said, make sure you take photos. <laughs> Oh, good. Okay, great. Absolutely. Take it from me if you need. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, so, yeah. So actually just kind of elaborate for me on the bullet points of your journey. So you went to school for illustration, but you're also a musician. Was that, did that come before or later? Like, tell me about that. I always enjoyed music. It was my escape. When I was a teenager, I would sit and play the piano for hours. I would sing. I would imagine I was on a stage. Like it's not literally, but just kind of like you'd have the sense of performing for someone and being heard. Yeah. And my family all would just gravitate towards the living room and they'd be reading or doing their own thing while I'd be playing. So I always had the sense of being appreciated when I was younger. And um, at some point in my adulthood, probably when I went off to college, you can't carry pianos in a case with you, you know, like you could a guitar, is when I just kind of put music aside and and I didn't probably pick it up until the kids were like preteen or teenage. Wow. I mean, I always played music now and again. There was one moment in high school that I performed for some sort of an assembly and it threw me so much. I, my nerves were so shook from it that I literally exited the stage in tears. Not that I have performed badly. That's an anxiety situation, but I didn't know, but I made the vow when I exited the stage, I will never do this again. It wow. wasn't worth it. Wow. And I kept that promise until age 40. So and then it just erupted out of you. You couldn't not do it anymore. Was that it? Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, at age 40, you do have something of a reevaluating of life. They call it mid midlife, you know, crisis or whatever, but yeah. it means what am I doing? What the hell am I doing? And um, for me, it was this marriage isn't working. That was in 2008. So we were having a meltdown financially. I got offered mm -hmm. a position on an Atlas for the Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi Emirate. And I said, well, that's great. I can work from home. No, we need you on site <laughs> in oh. Abu Dhabi. Wow. And I said, what? So I spent the next nine months in Abu Dhabi working like 12 or 13 hour days. It was huge. And I had four kids at home and it was easier working those long hours than it wasn't even just the kids. It was, it was a marriage where where things weren't weren't functioning correctly and so i had this big aha moment of this isn't working like the fact that it working this horrible job where there's all these politics going on and i'm you barely have time to eat in between all of this stuff that's easier than being at home mm. and why is that so that was my big aha moment and in that pressure I had to have an outlet. Some people write, some people do this or that for me. It expressed itself in that music. That music came that saved me in my teen years, came back out and said, all right, here I am. And I, I kept saying all these songs I'm writing, I, I thought I, if I could just hand them to someone else to perform because I still didn't want to perform. And I just thought there was a sense of um, an obligation to the message that I had that that made me learn how to play the guitar and perform because I felt like that needed to be expressed. I felt like it was so they were concepts and stories that were changing my own life. It was my own internal shakeup and I felt like they needed to be out there for other people. And that's how I overcame that a sense of bigger purpose overcame my, I will never perform again. I will never do this again from my, like, what is it? I wasn't even 20 when I said that. Wow. 
That's amazing. I, you knew I was going to ask you that question. <laughs> you get past it. So, okay. You just, well, you know, I don't know if I ever would have, except I really felt like this needs to be heard. And you didn't feel like there could have been an intermediary. Like you could have just given your music to someone. I mean, I'm so glad it's you doing it. It's supposed to be you doing it, but like that could have been like a, you could have just could have gone down the publishing route and said, yeah. let me just publish this music and, you know, make sure it's get, gets sent to people. But, you, you know, I didn't understand. There's a word for my life that I feel like pertains to a lot of this stuff in its context. I didn't have the context for myself, the music or anything I was doing to understand what it meant to me or what it could mean to someone else. I had a, certainly a soul driving force or feeling of what it needed, how it needed to go out there or that it needed to go out. But I didn't understand that it was primarily for me. It was such a sense of like um, doing it for somebody else. And that's the way I've gotten myself to do a lot of things. I, I Raising four kids on my own, certainly done imperfectly doing any single parenting is an imperfect uh thing absolutely yeah, of course um done very poorly especially for someone with squirrel brain which i do have um <laughs> not all my kids have squirrel brains so they really didn't understand and i had this perception that i had my shit together which means that i wasn't even recognizing the squirrel brain i was just like i'm very organized and then you know as as young adults, my kids laugh at me when I say that you're not very organized. <laughs> but, but you know, why? Like, I mean, you, okay, we'll, we'll get into that, but you do a lot of different things and all of them. I mean, your, your websites for all of your different things is something I'm going to get into. They all look beautiful. They, this, this is like a, a beautifully presented package that you're gifting to the world. That does not, that's not the sign of a disorganized mind to, to me. So, oh, <laughs> is it because you have stacks of stuff everywhere Th that's certainly part of it it's um missing dates on things mm. like going oh shoot that's today like okay. you know somebody calling and saying mom it's ethan's birthday <laughs> and i was like oh. oh yeah you're right got it okay <laughs> right <laughs> I did just have that exact experience with my best friend. I just didn't know it was the 18th of December. I, I, it's not that I don't know when his birthday is. I just didn't know it was the 18th. <laughs> so I can, I can relate a little bit. Interesting. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's, and, and so, but some of your kids are multi-passionate. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they are all multi-passionate in their own ways. Okay. And it's fascinating to me how unique they are and okay. So they don't appreciate me sitting there and, and looking at uh, their dads, myself and saying, this is what you've got from here. And here's what you got from here. But for me, it was always fascinating to see because it's from uh, two kids from my first husband, two kids from my second husband. And there are distinct differences in the way that they function between the two. There is such an interesting meld of what you inherit and how it expresses itself. Mm -hmm. And the things that we take, again, this is the unspoken inheritance we receive from our parents. It's the, the teaching, what we receive, never spoken, and we, we inherit it. And watching my kids pick up, maybe they would have done this anyway, but like mannerisms and ways of approaching things. One, one son, yes, he's, so yes, your question was, are they multi-passionate? Yes. Okay. My third son wouldn't answer any questions I had till he had the, the question turned around and he knew the perfect answer. This was something he had from an incredibly young age, hmm. a young age of, and that's something that nobody else in the family does. Nobody else turns it over carefully, carefully, not answering a question. This is something he's always done. I used to think he was just being stubborn, but no, he told me later no, that's what he was thinking. He had to think it through. He wanted to make sure he came up with the right answer. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, and again, if you are just a studier of the mechanisms of things that would apply to studying the mechanisms of your children, but they don't necessarily yeah. appreciate the No, <laughs> stop, stop psychoanalyzing me, mom. <laughs> that's a, 
That's fair. I understand. Um, so doubling back a little bit, when did you start playing the accordion? I think it's so cool that you played the accordion. <laughs> My second husband um, grew up learning the accordion and he had his old student accordion and at the time I picked it up, my brain couldn't wrap around it, but I just felt so cold to it. I didn't really pick it up until I started performing with this group in the, I don't remember what year it was, probably would have been 2013 or 14. And I didn't play the accordion. I had this one big one that had bass. Again, you know, I, I studied how to tear them apart. I probably bought two or three different accordions. Like one of them I started to pull apart. It was a 1920s because I was so fascinated. And then I was like, I'll put it back together and just sell it. Cause I didn't, I realized that there's a lot more than I wanted to mess with, but uh, yeah. So one had big bellows, big sound, and it just overwhelmed the small little, you know, trio that we were. And then another one was gifted to me and it's got what they call a tremolo. That means it's slightly, so they've got these reed banks inside and they're slightly off tune to each other and it creates a vibrato in your ear. And so that one oh. has like a little Parisian, like Parisian, like cafe sound is yeah. all I'd say with that one. And that one is a little student one from, again, it was probably, I want to say it's the twenties. It was somebody just was clearing their house and gifted it to me while I was with that group. Huh. That one is, my, that was the one I really loved for a while. I was really into it. I don't have a natural neck for it because again, now, I don't know if you experienced this, but it's like, if I can understand the concept, I think I should be able to skip ahead. Yeah. So, you know, accordion requires a lot of foundation building and I gave myself some of it, but not enough of it. So I love adding the accordion to like for rhythm support and it kind of has a little attitude, but I'm, I'm not a proficient uh, accordion. It's not a, uh, oh man, I've met some proficient ones the ones that really like catch my heart are the the jazz um the jazz accordionist mm, Man, yeah. I don't I don't know if you've looked at the bass side but they're they're designed a very specific way it's um at the top two ba uh, bars or rows are to single notes and then you've got chords and you've got diminished and sevenths and something something anyway it goes down like that and uh -huh. those jazz accordions Accordionists, they, they combine those things to create all of those rich, you know, have you ever heard an accordionist with that deep, rich sound? Yeah, absolutely. They're sitting there. Oh my gosh. They're like, they're hitting three or four of those things, building rich chords on that bass side. That's what I wish I could do, but that requires a lot more study than I'm willing to put into it. <laughs> See, here again, I'm listening to you and just relating so fully. So I'm a self-taught seamstress. And again, if we have this sort of like generalized cursory knowledge, like we could be, be proficient in a thing, but that isn't the same as specializing in it. And I mean, sewing is another one of those things where like you develop that skill over time. You have to practice. There are things, and I, I want to skip it all. I often yes. do. And things come out a little bit wonky. Yes. <laughs> like, so that's, I just gotten used to it. I'm, I'm literally wearing pants I made right now and they are very wonky. <laughs> so, so I feel like that sort of applies to how you have approached the accordion. I think of all of the musical instruments, I have a fascination with it. I have a friend who plays the accordion and I just think she is the coolest person I know. So I had I to ask you it. about it because what a fun, um, you know, hobby to, to pick up and, and how about, um, you're also a photographer. I have been doing photography and again, you probably noticed it with the Instagram, uh, account. Maybe, maybe you've noticed it with the Instagram account. I don't know where you saw it, but that's where I've been doing most of it. And it's, and will be again, still is a, like more of a spiritual practice. Mm. Again, I gave myself for any creative um, exercise, your leaving it open-ended never gives good results. You have to give yourself constraints. So my constraints were square format and centered. And so the, the, the challenge 
was when I would go for walks in the morning, they weren't like puff and puff exercising walks. They were walking a little bit more slowly on purpose. And whenever anything would catch my eye, that was my rule was you have to stop and figure out what it was that caught your eye. And so I would stop and then I would try to capture on film, whatever it was. Sometimes it was a lot of times it involved shadows because shadows are fascinating to me. Again, it's a, a huge and accurate metaphor for life or ourselves, meaning there's a lot of obvious lit things that we understand about ourselves, but those shadows, when you start looking at the shadows, they reflect the thing, but they aren't ever accurate. It never tells you what the thing is. Mm. So the shadows are part of it, but they're always like a little wonky. You could never look at a shadow. Well, you can't really look at a shadow and know how it looks. You can yeah. guess. Yeah. Anyway, so for it's me, it's kind of a distortion is, is how I think of it. So yeah. How interesting. So you give yourself kind of a, a rule which creates a container for a creative for exploration. Okay. Right. So, because if I had to solve all of it all the time, the photography would be, so we were talking about focus. This is one place where I really appreciate that ability to focus because it frees me then to look at the subject matter and not, not be trying all kinds of different things. Like I, I can, sit there the light and the shadow are super important I guess that's an obvious aha but for me it's just like I don't like working with fake light I work with things I can't so in my little container I don't permit myself to move anything it has to be as I found it so that's what's fascinating to me about it's like for a long time I'd say I found sidewalk messages and um, a lot of you can find a lot of those on that Wendy Sue Hunt Instagram because they would be in the most fascinating like little logo forms, like little logo forms, letter forms. Um, there was a, I'm not gonna remember the website right now. There was a, uh, it wasn't a website. It was a Facebook group for like those kinds of things. And I can't remember the name of it, but it was like basically the appearance of messages people would do it like they would write it so it looks like it should be letter forms it looks like it should be letters and it was art based on um on that appearance of some sort of communication and of course you find that whether it's bird footprints animal footprints they're all messages they are like if you say that the alphabet the letters form meaning then any of these tracks, any of this repetition then has something. And so when I would find these little sticks and they'd be in these different little shapes or a, a leaf just so with the shadow that just is a certain way, there was, you know, when you see something that, um, that ha speaks to you, there's like a stillness almost like, mm -hmm. and that's what I sensed. It's just like, where everything gets quiet and you see this one thing. And that's what it struck me as all these like perfect little messages. How do they land like that? And sometimes I would imagine that the trees were like sending down messages. I think one of my poems was, was about uh, a deodar cedar in our front yard. She would throw cones and needles and everything down on the ground. and. I would every so often just rake them all up. And I imagined she was up there going like, I'm giving you messages, keep destroying all my art. <laughs> not listening, <you> know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a beautiful example of noting the beauty around you, you know, and stopping and smelling the roses in a sense is to just like pause. And I, I, I'm having my own aha moment as I'm listening to you because giving yourself a container in which to work makes, for example, photography, I have a good camera. I have a desire. I was just thinking about this. I have a desire perhaps in the new year to get better at it because I'm terrible at it, but it's so overwhelming. And maybe if I were just to take a smaller, like, you know, parameters, like something yeah. just like you have square. Okay. 
and shadow and I can't move it. I mean, I, I really like that idea as a way to make something overwhelming feel a whole lot less so. I totally, totally agree because my brain wants to encompass everything, right? Yeah. That's the way I wrote music too, is uh, when I first started writing music, <laughs> I would write, one of my songs is a walk I took. Because again, like I would constrain myself. When I first started learning music, I had a very well-developed ear because I played so much music. I understood chords, but I couldn't explain them to anybody. I still can't really explain. I understand more of their relationship with each other, but I made these complex songs and they just went all over the place. And so I'd constrain myself as I got, got on a little bit. I said, all right, you can only use three chords. Okay, what can I create with three chords? Wow. Or I would just give myself a, I taught a song, songwriting course once and I said, go out there and I want you to write down things that you see while you're out there. You have 15 minutes, come back. And so they just wrote down things they saw and came back in and their songs because the mind wants to create organization. What that means is you could write about something you saw in the course of 15 minutes. And when you set it to three chords, it's got enough metaphor meaning that it's a song. And then you can riff on that if you want to. But it, so songwriting is a lot simpler then people might make it. You just have to start being willing to give yourself small containers. I can only use three chords. All right, I only get three verses instead of, you know, 10, which I would do <laughs> when yeah. I first started writing. It really is like, I, I'm thinking of all of these things I can apply this to and immediately feeling like I can breathe more easily. You know, also, let's just take some time and make this the container that this, fit, which is so sort of counterintuitive for people like us who don't like containers. <laughs> like we are outside of the box all the time. So how interesting that this is sort of helpful in, in making focus a little bit easier. Well, I, I do believe, so one of my biggest strengths is creativity, creativity period, not just a specific set. And I do believe that that is uh, something that is necessary for the creative spirit you with the more restrictions that you give yourself the more constraints the more creative the product when you yeah. leave it open-ended it can feel like the the blank slate like the, the deer in the headlights kind of like i could do anything so i'll do nothing yeah so giving playing making games for yourself that's a huge way like play games that where you restrict Strict everything you say all I have is you know a sponge and a you know <laughs> yeah whatever a rubber yeah. duck now what can I do <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's uh, it's, and I, I believe um I don't know if you've ever read Twyla Tharp's book on creativity I can't remember the title of it right now um but she does that it's a lot about like giving you like an odd assortment of things but I never saw it as limiting your options I just saw it as like a random selection of things you were supposed to make something out of but I think that that maybe was what her intent was in creating those those exercises I just remembered um, the word so what's that? the word the word is a summit a S C E M I C that is a semic writing R is that writing that looks like it should mean something. Oh, so I yeah. think that the, so I think the Facebook group is something like a semic writing in a post-apocalyptic era or something weird like that. Cool. Oh, post -literate. I, <laughs> I think it's post-literate. Okay. I'll send yeah. it to you later when I find it. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so since we're talking about creating structure in a world where we tend to sort of issue structure, how do you structure your time so that you are able to have all your various pursuits and move the needle forward on your projects? Well, in this case, I'm going to be um, real frank with you. It's still a struggle for me. Hmm. The creative process, learning to, because I've, I've done creative work all of my adult professional life. And so how do you create on a timeline? How do you find 
the creative part of your spirit, how do you tempt it out of its little burrow consistently on a clock, right? And I did find a way to do it, but it was, it's kind of, it can be tedious. It can include a lot of workaholic tendencies, so that's probably not due to that. Can you re repeat your question again? Yeah, I, I really was just because you have so many websites that are for different avenues of your own creative endeavors. How do you get, how do you move the needle? How do you get oh, those projects move done? the needle? So this last year has been one of taking courses to learn to run a business in an effective way. Mm, so interesting. It's a kind of backwards way of operating. I think you, you have people who are not creative and they need this kind of structure for their businesses as a creative. I was told going through these courses, you need to reduce the scope of what you're trying to accomplish. You need to focus. And then the advice, right. And that, because I came out of the years of working and supporting my family and the way I did that was I had one consistent client, one big consistent client, and I would just make myself stay in the chair, you know, and work. And it was on the computer. So when I got this advice last year, there's a huge part of myself that just rebelled. I was just like, fuck that. I'm not, yeah. gonna, I am not going to keep editing myself. Do you want me to keep editing myself? Because I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So a long time ago, I started what is now the Wendy Sue Hunt site. It went through a lot of different iterations and growth. Um, it started out, I called it road to Abu Dhabi because, or road to Dubai, because I, when I was working in Abu Dhabi, would drive between Abu Dhabi and Dubai and back again, I'd stop at one mall out there, just rest. And then I'd head back because I was thinking because it helped me process to be moving while I was thinking. So a lot of that first stuff was that road to Dubai. And that's what I called the site. And then I just, it evolved. I can't remember if it went through another name, but then it ended up Wendy Suhand. I was like, screw this. <laughs> it's just going to be, it's just going to be me. And it's hard to move the needle on everything. I've got a ton of content, a ton of, like you notice that I've got a retail site. I've got branding and website development. Yeah. And I've got my personal site. And I've got a lot more that should be in there in each of those areas than I have actually put in there. So time management for me is, um, is still a struggle. I, I watched your, or yeah, watched, listened to your podcast on time management for school brains. And that yeah. was, that was helpful to say, like, you don't need to do everything every morning because there are like, I want to do yoga, <laughs> but I also want a writing practice because that's where I have the biggest aha moments. I understand what my brain's thinking. And again, once you understand that you may have that executive dysfunction and that, that what is in your line of sight is more important. If you are the person who processes out loud, you could be telling someone else, but that's when you realize what you actually think. Mm -hmm. That's all connected. And yeah. writing helps me externalize my thoughts so I can understand them. I can't think inside my head. It has to be spoken out loud or written. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a big thing for me was discovering that even if I were to limit all of my like my morning ritual tasks to a half an hour, I'm still not starting my morning for two or three hours. And it's that's just it's an impractical approach to life. <laughs> you have things you have to do, you have deadlines you have to meet, that doesn't work. And so I have it's been kind of freeing to just sort of like pick two, you know, or three in a day and know that over the course of the week, I may access that particular thing that I love only four times, but at least that has sort of eliminated a lot of that, like feeling like a failure. I didn't get to all of this today. It makes me feel like a failure. So I like taking that sort of story and throwing it out the window, but you have, so you have four websites. You've got the Windy Sue hunt, and then you have your plum Nelly for explain you've got music. Oh, well, music, which is really still since quarantine and COVID, we just haven't been updating it. So we do have the Planelli Music 
We have Plum Nelly Productions, which is brand and website. Right. And we've got, what was the last? Oh, right. Dry goods. Tales. <laughs> yeah. Plum Nelly Dry Goods, which yeah. I'm developing and evolving now. And that one is like a passion project. project. I love creating merchandise. I love I loved figuring out how to integrate and to create because everything I've done is graphics related, which means it lives in the ether, you right. know, until it's printed. And so the idea that I can take any of my concepts and develop them to be printed as people need them or want them for wearables or whatever is just really fascinating to me. Yeah. So that one I have really enjoyed. And yeah, so websites. Yeah, I've got all of those websites developed and I've got a lot of websites I'm supporting as well. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, you mean in the, in terms of branding and that kind of thing, right? Clients, right. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I like, I think that my advice for people like us, when they're sort of like, what do I do next is when you want to go get a website is to get one that's your name because technically, (laughs) because people like us are we're the brand, we're the niche, I think. And then at the bottom, I love what you do. You point to all your other websites in the footer of your, of, of the Wendy Sue Hunt one. And so people can find, you know, if what they're interested in is your music, they will still find their way to that site because this notion, like that's another one of the, the stories that we're told is that we will confuse people if we're not just one thing. And you yeah, know, God forbid us, we yeah. confuse people because that would be terrible. But like it, this, the, here is a way that people who find you and like your brand, which is you, can find the other things that you're doing that are all part of your brand, which is you. And this is the approach that I am taking. This is the approach I would encourage other people to take. If you never know from one day to the next, if what's going to you know, inspire you that day is playing music or creating printed water bottles for people to buy having an, like having all of those different sort of branches coming off of your one main brand, I just think is a really smart approach. And that's, I'm so glad we like got to this at the end of the interview, because that is the part that I was just like, this is why I have to talk to her because she's got like four different websites and they're all cool. And they're all like, there's an umbrella that brings them together in a cohesive way. I used the same, uh, I developed the template and used the same template with color shifts, palette shifts, except for music. Plum Nelly music looks different than the others, but I did that on purpose because I just thought, well, I could make this all one website, but there are different reasons for these websites. So I'll let them remain their own thing but I'm going to tie them together so that as though they have the same navigation. So that's why I wanted them to be able to navigate to each other and speak to each other. Yeah. I think that that's so smart and it gives me so many ideas for, because I have a component of my brand right now that isn't really making sense under the one single website. So this is the, the spinoff website, but I like the template idea. Like that's, yep. yeah, this is, this is so good. I really love this. <laughs> and we didn't um, even talk about brand yet, but I guess we're, we're, we're running to the end. It's yeah. Just yeah. You- I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Is there anything about um, your brand design that you would like to speak to? Cause I, that's sort of your, your main gig. Yeah. Maybe uh, yeah. I do. I have, <laughs> I, what I do as a, as a nine to five, so to speak, it's not sh- strictly nine to five is I do graphic design and support and branding and websites. And all of this is tied into talking about symbols and that which which represents us. Again, that whole idea of the logo and the brand. And, you know, you talked about us being the brand, but um, having something that has deep meaning and that is tied into who we are and what we're about. That's what, (laughs) that's what I like to bring to my brands is that sense of that stillness, that, that meaning that's beyond the thing that's in front of you, like those photos uh, that I took of the sidewalk messages. 
Yeah. And anyway, so that's the brand aspect to it. That's what I like to bring is that deeper life well lived that sense that what goes in front of my clients it, uh, uh, leads leads the parade, so to speak, and introduces them to the world as something that represents them deeply and um, has a power of its own. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. I think that you would be, you know, particularly great at do, providing these services to multi-passionate people because you understand them and because you're, you you have these like different approaches to storytelling. So yeah, it, it's, it's, I love it so much. Um, do I, I, we have been talking about the URLs for your websites, but tell my listeners again, how they can find you include your Instagram and all that good stuff. So at Wendy Sue Hunt, uh, is the Instagram and everything else. Um, and I've got Plum Nelly Dry Goods, Plum Nelly Productions, Plum Nelly Music. We are talking about combining those. It just feels like such a lot to support. So we have been talking about like, do we want to combine those? But um, on as far as URLs, wendysuhunt.com, again, plumnellydrygoods.com, plumnellyproductions.com, and plumnellymusic.com. <laughs> so fun. I absolutely love it. I'm going to adopt your approach, I think. <laughs> so it's a good one. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and being here with me today. This has been an absolute joy. And I look forward to speaking with you again really soon, Wendy. Thank you. All right. Take care. You too. Thank you. You guys, thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Wasn't that fun? There's just a lot about what Wendy does that I'm going to start applying to my own life. I hope you guys got as much out of it as I did. And be sure to hit subscribe so you never miss any awesome conversations like this one. Also, if you found this content valuable enough to warrant a tip, you can show your appreciation by visiting buymeacoffee.com forward slash Jenny O'Connor. You can also support the show by rating and reviewing, but if you do, be sure to take a screenshot of your review, post it in your stories, and tag me at your creative fairy godmother. That way, you will be entered into my giveaway for the best book I have ever come across in my life on how to slay imposter syndrome, The Middle Finger Project by the inimitable and ever so sassy Ash Amberger. The contest runs until December 31st, and trust me when I tell you, you guys, this book will change your life. It did mine. Just just go with me on this. It's, it's so good. It is that good. Don't forget also to drop your name on the waitlist for my new program, The Multi-Passionate Master Plan. I am sincerely hoping to change a few lives with this course, and I'd love for yours to be one of them. You can do that at jennyoconnor.com forward slash master plan. So that's it for today. I love you guys so much. I hope you have an amazing last couple of weeks of this year. And until next time, get up, get out and do the thing. <laughs>